Welcome uh, everyone you know, to uh, today's uh, second lecture uh, to be given by Dr. Yunhua Wu uh, from, uh, from the Pearl, Pearl Lab. Uh, I think I, I would like that uh, Dr. Wu explain to you what, what is the name Pearl means. Um, I hope that she knows. <laughs> uh, from the uh, Shenyashin University, Zhongshan uh in Zhuhai. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, her her background is that uh, she got her um her bachelor degree and master degree uh, from the China University of Geosciences in in Wuhan, and then afterward uh, she went to went to the Purple Mountain Observatory, the Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences, and uh, becoming uh, an expert on meteorites, uh, um, chronological dating. And as she will explain later to you, and and um, and I just find out that her her advisor is uh, Professor Xu Xu Wei Bang, uh, Xu Wei Biao, and uh, um, and her uh, her title today, her talk today, the title is about lunar petrology. I would say uh, a very interesting topic, but a little bit complicated, and uh, so so it would demand a lot of attention from us, you know, to understand uh, what she's trying to to say. Um, the previous talk uh, on this uh, same topic is by uh, Professor Kale Peters of the Brown University. So if you want to know more about, you know, after this talk, I uh, want to learn more uh, still, uh, and that uh, you could go to that uh, uh, video lecture. So uh, Dr. Wu, uh, uh, welcome to, um, to this lecture series and, and please start. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, first, I will uh, explain what is PER. It is Planetary Environmental and Astrobiological Research Laboratory. It is in uh, Sun Yat-sen University in Zhuhai. Can you see yes, the very screen good, now? Very good. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, uh, thank you for having me here and thank you for the introduction. I will uh, discuss and introduce a little about lunar petrology. This is really a complicated uh, issue. Uh, I will only introduce it briefly. And first I will introduce something about returned samples and the lunar meteorites, the differences and the similarities. Then I will show some pictures uh, about the highland rocks and male basalts and also pressure. And at last I will introduce uh, something about limitations of current lunar rocks. Uh, first, we have already learned a lot about the moon through previous exploration missions uh, by orbiters and landers, including the tomog um, topography, morphology, thermal conditions, and gravi gravity. And most importantly, we get the chemical um, composition of the lunar surface. For example, this picture is, I will, this shows the uh, topography map of the moon, and this is the ion content of the moon. We will see uh, it is very heterogeneous on, uh, on the moon, and this is ion rich area, and this is ion poor area. But still, lunar rocks provide valuable information that cannot be replaced by remote sensing techniques. So uh, what can rock samples tell us? Uh, this is a, an interesting picture. This is a micro crater um, produced on the lunar rocks by meteor impact. Um, then uh, the rock, they make it possible for petrologists and geochemists to conduct in situ analysis on a micro scale. And they will make, um, for example, the, this picture is a false color compositional map of a lunar meteorite. The different color means different uh, element. The green areas is olivine and the uh, blue areas is plagiarclase. Detailed observation of the 
petrologic texture and accurate analysis of mineral composition allow us to understand the chemical composition and evolution during uh, magma magmatism. And this figure is uh, isotopic dating, and this is my favorite. Uh, this picture shows a mineral called apatite. Apatite is enriched in uranium and lead, which allow us to analyze the isotopic composition of this mineral. And the composition will, uh, through Mellon calculations, they will tell us the isotopic age of this mineral. However, whether this isotopic age could represent the crystal crystallization age or their shock reset age is uh, need a lot of work to do. And in some other cases, um, in other isotopic systems, we can also get other ages like exposure ages. Uh, this will tell us when the rock exposed to lunar surface. So the most important thing is the lunar rocks can make it possible for us to do the in-situ microscale analyze and to understand more about the magmatism, the isotopic ages, and uh, the chemical compositions. Most sample return missions were conducted during the Soviet and the USA space race of the 1960s and 1970s. And these are rocks uh, returned by Apollo and these are rocks returned by lunar mission. And in December, in December 2020, our Channel 5 mission have also returned lunar soil samples weighted one point uh, seven kilograms. It has been over 40 years since the last sample return missions. Thanks to the return samples, we know the chemical components of the moon. Uh, most importantly, we know uh, what minerals are there in lunar rocks. The dominant minerals are plagioclase, pyroxene, olivine, and ilmenite. The first three are silicates, and ilmenite uh, is oxide. Plagioclase is a member of feldspar. It is a mixture of uh, sodium aluminum silicate and calcium aluminum silicate. The um, sodium rich end is called albite. The uh, calcium rich end is called anorthite. Most, um, most plagioclase on the moon is the calcium rich end, is anorthite. And also, there are some uh, plagioclase that, uh, that is uh, a mixture of. Uh, sodium rich end and potassium rich end. This is called alkaline feldspar. The potassium rich end is called orthoclase, and the sodium rich end is albite. This is a little complicated, but we just need to know two things. First, um, most plagioclase on the moon is calcium plagioclase, calcium rich. We also call anorthite. And only a little plagioclase on the moon is potassium rich or sodium rich. Second, pyroxene. Pyroxene is a mineral that, that is uh, composed of uh, calcium, magnesium, ion, and uh, silica. It is also complicated and we can uh, classify the pyroxene uh, based on the crystal structure um, usually, pyroxene is classified into clinal pyroxene and also pyroxene. They have different um, crystal structures. Clinal pyroxene is, uh, um, has a wide compositional range from uh, calcium rich into calcium poor end. But also, pyroxene only uh, contains a little calcium. And the relative calcium content in also pyroxene is below five. Uh, so sometimes we will call also pyroxene, LCP. Uh, it means low calcium pyroxene. 
And if the pyroxene is enriched in calcium, we may call it uh, HCP, which means uh, calcium rich pyroxene. Although cholinopyroxene um, also has some calcium poor uh, composition, uh, most of cholinopyroxene is very calcium rich. And also pyroxene is calcium poor. Um, as observed from Apollo samples and the chemical maps of the of our remote sensing, we know that also pyroxene, which means uh, calcium poor pyroxene, often occurs in highland rocks. And calcium rich pyroxene would present both in highland rocks and male rocks. The composition of olivine and ilmenite is relatively simple. And olivine is magnesium uh, ion silicates and ilmenite is an ion titanium oxide. Because the lunar mineralogy is quite simple, it only has four major minerals. So the lunar rocks, uh, it would exhibit a relatively predictable chemical composition. Rocks contain more pleasure clays would be more aluminum rich because pleasure clays contains much aluminum. And the rocks um, contains more pyroxene and olivine would be more iron and magnesium rich because pyroxene and olivine would contains more magnesium and iron. Also, there are other accessory phases um, most uh, in a rock sample, in a lunar rock sample, these phases only account for less than five uh, percent or even less than one percent. Uh, for example, potassium feldspar, phosphate, sulfides, and zirconium bearing minerals. For myself, I like phosphates and the zirconium rich uh, minerals because they are suitable for um, chronological dating of lunar rocks. And also phosphate is a major carrier of rare earth elements. And other researchers may pay more attention to other minerals, for example, crystallite and tridimite. They are silica. They are silica, but they may form under different conditions. So uh, the presence of crystallite and tridimite in lunar rocks may shed light on the thermal status during rock formation. And now we know the lunar mineralogy. Uh, we were able to uh, determine what rocks are lunar meteorites. The first lunar meteorites were identified um, over 10 years after the first sample return mission. This is the first lunar meteorite. It is called AALHA 81005. It was found in Antarctica in 1981 and named after Alan Hears. And the fusion crust, this black fusion crust, is formed when it enters the atmosphere. Interaction with atmosphere would cause melting of the surface. It means uh, the rock is from the outer space. And the brachiated texture, this, this is a big anostic class setting a fine grained matrix. This is quite similar to the uh, composition and texture of some Apollo samples. And then more detailed uh, studies and analysis on the com mineral composition in uh, noble gases, and the uh, sidro uh, sidrophil elements all reveal that it is a lunar meteorite. And after that, we are more confident in how to um, in how to classify a meteorite, a lunar meteorite. After that, about four hundred and seventy six lunar meteorites were found. This number is. Uh, um, by this August. And this is, shows the number of lunar meteorites we found in different country. And also there are about 200 meteorites that are purchased in Northwest Africa, but we do not know the location where they were found. 
Most of them are found in desert or Antarctica. So if you are trying to find a lunar meteorite by yourself, hot desert and Antarctica are highly recommended. Because uh, like in this picture, if you went to a desert and see a rock covered by a black fusion crust, a thin black fusion crust, uh, like uh, it is formed uh, from uh, when it's entered the atmosphere, then you may know it is a meteorite. The return samples is uh, kind of different from meteorites because the samples were um, collected from the lunar surface and this is a drilled core of the return sample. We can see mainly uh, this, these are lunar soils. These are fine grade particles. However, uh, meteorites often uh, are consolidated rock samples because they were ejected from the lunar surface by large impact. They need to survive during entering the atmosphere and during eject from the uh, lunar surface. So they are always uh, large and consolidated rocks. But lunar uh, return samples can be fine grained and loose. Second, we know that most of the uh, lunar samples were returned from the near side of the moon. This is the near side of the moon. And geochemically, the samples were collected from Procellarium creep terra. Uh, this is a terra that is geochemically distinct region with relatively high abundance of thorium. So uh, the rocks returned from the missions may just represent the um, a special chemical composition of, of this uh, geochemical distinctive region. However, the lunar rocks may eject from the lunar surface more randomly. They are randomly distributed on the lunar surface. We don't know where it came from, but we know that the uh, thorium content of lunar rocks, as shown in these dots, span a wide range compared to uh, Apollo samples. So um, since Apollo samples were collected from the thorium rich um, areas, the lunar samples may come from other places. So it is possible that the lunar meteorites are more representative of uh, the composition of lunar surface. Um, both return samples and meteorites have advantages and disadvantages. If we, want, if we want to conduct a comprehensive study on the lunar petrology, we'd better combine them together. Thanks to return samples, we can assign different rock types to terrains on the moon. Uh, the male, which is dark, is mostly composed of male basalt. Uh, the major minerals are pyroxene, olive, and ilmenite, and they contain less plagioclase than highlands. Highlands are plagioclase rich. This is a, a northite, which is composed mostly of plagioclase. And also both male and highland areas have many branches. Bracher is this, uh, this brush, brushed rocks because impact break may breaks up, may break apart the pristine rocks and glue them together, forming the brushed texture. Um, first, let's take a look at the pristine non-male rocks. Why we are interested in pristine rocks? Because uh, we know that breccia may be um, a mixture of many lithologies. So um, we need to find pristine uh, rocks first. So they may learn, tell us more about the origin and the uh, pristine characteristic of the moon. There are several, uh, there are, several requirements to identify a pristine rock. The most important thing is the absence of contamination by sedulose, uh, 
by sider uh, sidrophile elements contaminated by meteorites. So if uh, maybe some uh, meteorites be maybe uh, graduated, but if it is not contaminated by a meteorite, we can also think it is pristine. After a lot of study, there are three major pristine non metal rocks identified. Uh, ferron anorthite, magnesium suit, and alkaline suit. Also, creep basalt is also thought to be pristine non metal rocks, uh, but some may classify it as an independent group. Some may classify this as a, a member of alkaline suit. Uh, here we will introduce them separately. First, I want to uh, introduce a little about the nomenclature. The lunar minerals are relatively simple, but sometimes the terms may be misleading and complicated. Usually we will classify rocks based on relative abundance of minerals. Uh, for example, like uh, the left figure, if a mineral contains plagioclase more than 19%, uh, we will call it a norsocyte. And if it contains more than 90% olivine, we will call it dunite. And Additionally, for rocks dominated by uh, plagioclase and pyroxene, it may be further classified based on the abundance of orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene. FYI, clinopyroxene usually contains more calcium than orthopyroxene. This is uh, also called HCP, and this is also called LCP. If a rock contains more also pyroxene, then clinopyroxene, it is called a norite. And if it contains more uh, clino, uh, more, more clinopyroxene than also pyroxene, it would call a gabbro. It is quite complicated, but I think um, maybe you don't have to remember so much information. And I will just show you some pictures. Oh, also, this is um, uh, this figures help us to understand the chemical difference between different pristine non metal rocks. The ferron anorthite would contain less magnesium um, than than magnesium suit, and the mag uh, the composition of plagioclase that means uh, how much calcium the uh, plagioclase contain. If it is 100%, it means uh, the calcium is, it means the plagioclase is uh, the calcium rich. And if, if it is on this end, it means the plagioclase contains more sodium. So the uh, plagioclase in ferro anorthite would contain more sodium than others. And the magnesium suit would contain more uh, magnesium in MAFI minerals contains to uh, these two. And creep basalt is uh, got its name because it contains many potassium, rare earth element, and phosphorus. So the uh, rare earth element composition uh, abundance is much more than those in ferro and northsides. You just, uh, you just need to remember that uh, different pristine non metal rocks have different composition. And there are several uh, requirements that we can identify, identify them. This is a typical ferron anorthite. We can see the coarse plagioclase under microscope. These are plagioclase. These are plagioclase. The plagioclase account for about uh, 98 more than 90% of this sample. Other mafic minerals are augite, autopyroxene, and minoalminite. This rock is called the uh, Genesis rock because it may represent a piece of the moon's uh, primary crust. And this rock, based on the texture, this rock 
must have formed by a process of pleasure class accumulation. Uh, so why it, this rock is quite important? Because this rock uh, let the scientists uh, propose the uh, hypothesis of lunar magma ocean. The, what is lunar magma ocean? It, uh, the, in early in this history, the moon was uh, totally molten. The minerals may crystallize following the sequence. So olivine is the first mineral to crystallize and then also pyroxene are the second phase to crystallize. After crystallization, these minerals are uh, relatively dense and they may uh, sink to form the mantle sink down and form the mantle. So the mantle is uh, mainly composed of olive and uh, also pyroxene, that is LCP. And then the residue melt is enriched in incompatible elements and ion. And after crystallization of olive and pyroxene, the plagiar class started to uh, crystallize. However, the residue made is iron rich, so the uh, melt is quite um, dense. The plagiar class is lighter than the melt, so the plagiar class started to float to the surface of the moon. And after uh, a solidification of lunar magma ocean, the lunar, the moon would have a fell basic crust. It means the crust is uh, mostly composed of plagiar class. And the uh, last drag of L uh, of lunar magma ocean melt would be so much enriched in uh, potassium, rare earth element, phosphorus, and those incompatible elements that would form creep, creep uh, basalt. Then the in the mantle because the um, the minerals will sink and float, and the mantle would be. Uh, composed mostly of olivine and uh, other pyroxene. This is just a simple model of lunar magma ocean. And this is uh, this source is uh, enriched in creep, and this may be the source for creep basalt. Creep basalt looks just like a uh, male basalt, but it contains much more potassium and other rare earth elements. So this is also, um, let us think that the lunar magma ocean is quite reasonable. More importantly, this is a dating result for uh, ferro anorthite. The crystallization ages of ferro anorthite are ancient. So uh, we think it is consistent with uh, the solidification of the feldspathic crust. The zircon, this is the zircon from Apollo Brescia gives an age of 4.4 jillion uh, years, which is suggested to represent the younger limit for solidification of the lunar magma ocean because uh, crystallization of zircon should occur in a melt that is enriched in zirconium and other incompatible elements. So this is con correspond to the late stage of uh, lunar magma ocean when the creep started to form or um, yeah, when the creep started to form. So this could be used as a, a younger age limit for solidification of the lunar magma ocean. However, the ages of ferro anorthite is much more complicated. Um, they have a wide range and even for a single rock, for example, uh, different techniques may reveal different ages. So uh, some ages may, uh, may be uh, reset by thermal events, but still there are also many ferro anorthite younger than, younger than this age. Uh, for example, uh, this, this sample, 6025, this sample is suggested to have a crystallization age of 4.3 jillion uh, years. This is younger than expected. So uh, the cooling of lunar magma ocean may be more complicated 
and prolonged. For example, it may uh, cool uh, over uh, longer years than we thought. All the lunar magma uh, ocean hypothesis is wrong. Maybe there doesn't exist any magma ocean. Uh, the second pristine lunar rocks is the magnesium suit. The magnesium suit is uh, the mineralogy is complicated compared to ferro and because different rocks may have different uh, proportions of plagioclase. For example, norite would contain plagioclase uh, less than 50%, and chaptolite contains plagioclase uh, more than 15%, but also the olivine in chaptolite is also uh, maybe over 20 or 30%. And the pleasure class in Donut is quite, uh, is quite uh, less than other samples. Um, it should be noted that the magnesium suits are only classified based on the mineralogy uh, because they had less uh, pleasure class than ferro and norsocyte. And also the content of, of magnesium is uh, higher than other rocks. So we classify them as magnesium suit. But maybe uh, the rocks from this group are not related to each other. Um, and the formation mechanism is uh, still under debate. But we think that they may have uh, represent the intrusions into primary lunar crust. The third is a uh, Alkaline suit. Alkaline suit is uh, the mineralogy is similar to uh, the uh, to to magnesium suit or ferro and arsite. It's just they have uh, they have more content of alkaline elements like uh, sodium or potassium. For example, this rock is mainly composed of potassium and coal. Actually, uh, this uh, this. So it is only occurs as very small rock fragments or clasts. Detailed analysis suggests that uh, this suit is derived from fractional crystallization of creep basalt, but we only found a small portion of this. Uh, now let's take a look at male basalt. Male basalt uh, exposed over the 17th uh, area, 17% of the lunar surface area. They are mostly exposed on the near side of the moon. Uh, this may result from the non-uniform distribution of heat source relating to the early uh, lunar differentiation and some evolution. They, are, um, they look just like terrestrial basalts. These are rocks we found on, on the Earth. And these are uh, the lava flow on the earth. They look quite similar. And also uh, the lava that formed lunar male basalt is similar to uh, the Pahoho type, uh, lava type in Hawaii as shown in the left figure. It is quite um, uh, smooth. And the lava erupted and filled in large basins uh, pre uh, the basins are previously formed by impact. Uh, so they may form a, a relatively smooth surface and sometimes with uh, rope-like coils. And also in some region, uh, there also exists lava fountain. Uh, the, but uh, in this scenario, pyroclastic glass are formed. But most of the male basalt we observed are formed under uh, this condition. This is the male basalt we observed. This is quite similar to creep basalt, but the uh, creep composition, it means uh, the potassium incompatible elements are much less uh, than creep. The male basalt often have uh, mainly mafic minerals like uh, pyroxene and olivine. Pyroxene and olivine would account for more than 15% of the rock and plagioclase, uh, usually less than 
And in, more importantly, pyroxene in male basalt is dominated by cleaner pyroxene, which, uh, which means the, the pyroxene is relatively calcium rich. And this is a different texture of male basalt. These pictures show that the basalt with different grain size. Uh, the left one is uh, a slightly large xenocryst would set in a, a matrix of, of fine grained minerals. And the middle is crystalline uh, with less shaped plagioclase and uh, zoned gray pyroxene. This is relatively coarse grained. Usually the texture texture is independent of the whole raw chemistry. For example, this is a schematic model of uh, the Pahoho flow. Uh, this means the different uh, rocks with different compositions may form uh, similar textures. In general, fine grained rocks may come from the surface, and coarse grained rocks may come from uh, uh, come from deep down. So it is not. Um, so usually, we do not classify um, male basalts based on their texture. Usually, we classify them based on their chemistry. The distinction between the different classes of basalt is uh, are based initially on titanium oxide, uh, secondarily on alumina or potassium content. Most importantly, if we classify, uh, if we um, classify the uh, male basalt based on the titanium content, we can uh, relate the rocks to uh, the chemical map we observed from remote sensing techniques. So we can relate uh, the rock samples to uh, the lunar, uh, to the location of the lunar surface. Uh, last, lunar barrature. Lunar barrature is not pristine, uh, except for those uh, monomict. Monomict means uh, there's only one lithology in the barrature. Uh, but most of them have more than one lithology. They are modified by impacts. Impacts are common on the moon. This picture shows an impact occurs around uh, 2013, a uh, few years ago. It means uh, there are many, many impact events happened on the moon through history. We, uh, we said that meteorites impact may both break rocks apart and glue them together. So the texture and composition of a bracha is quite complicated. And this is a composition of uh, male basalt. This is a composition of the uh, highland rocks. If the, if the bracha comes from the highland and com composed mostly of highland uh, materials, it may, uh, fall, uh, it may close to this end. And if the bracha comes from the male areas, it may close on this end. And in the middle, it means the bracha is a mixture of highland and male materials. This is a schematic figure of the formation of a, compli of a complex impact crater. So bracha with different textures may be formed at different places. For example, monomic bratures may form in the under underlying bedrock and demic bratures formed when uh, impact melt are filled in the veins. Fragmental ejecta with polymic texture was thrown at distance. And a mixture of hot and cold fragmental debris falls back into the crater may form a crystalline matrix pressure and melt sheet. Compositionally, if the uh, impact happened on the uh, complicated layers, for example, the pack the impact may penetrate into the interface of highland and buried material and buried male materials 
So this pressure would be composed, uh, would be a, would have a minder composition of highland and um, male composition. Also, uh, a distal ejector would uh, throw to this surface due to a uh, giant impact, due, due to a uh, big impact. So the um, chemical composition of a pressure would be very complicated. This is a monomic pressure, which means it only has one lithology. This monomic pressure is only composed of a north side. This is a, a regular spiratrial, and this spiratrial is composed mostly of basaltic composition. Uh, this is a basaltic class. This is a basaltic matrix. And this is also a regular spiratrial. It contains um, basaltic class, creep class, granitic class, the, com uh, the composition is much more complicated than uh, they are derived from different source bedrocks and then consolidated together. This is an impact map pressure. Uh, these areas are uh, impact melt. They were crystallized from impact melt. The matrix is uh, quite uh, is an impact, and this is a lithic class. Also, impact melt would also occur as class. For example, uh, this is an impact melt class. This is an impact melt class. The identification of impact melt is quite, um, it's not that complicated, but but need, uh, need much, much more experience. You have to uh, observe many, many, many rocks, then you will know which is impact melt, which is uh, the regular rock class. The demic pressure are relatively rare. This type is um, found in Apollo 16, and it is character characterized by a monomic pressure setting a fine-grained vein-like matrix. It is quite, um, quite rare because we did not find any, anything like this in meteorites. Also, uh, there are new, some new lithologies in class. For example, this is a class in polymic pressure. Uh, the composition is does uh, does not uh, like any of the rock samples we introduced earlier. It contains uh, less magnesium than magnesium suit and uh, can, but more magnesium than ferro-anorthite suit, uh, ferro-anorthite. So why this uh, this class is very important because. The lower content of magnesium and incompatible elements and the lower uh, thorium uh, shows that they are nothing like uh, ferro-anorthite. Because in the lunar magma ocean hypothesis, the uh, crust should be ferro-anorthite. But this class, the composition of this class is, um, it is possible that it is also a dominate phase on the moon. And it might represent the far side of the moon. And this, uh, this is quite complicated. I just uh, give you the um, conclusion. And conclusion is uh, this may uh, represent the uh, far side, the, the, uh, this may represent the first basic crust of the far side, and the ferro uh, north side may represent the uh, crust of the near side. So there are two possibilities. Uh, they, try to, uh, they try to revise the lunar magma ocean to, uh, uh, to explain 
the differences of the far side and the near side. And also they have, uh, they have proposed a, a new a model to uh, account for this. This is called serial magmatism. Uh, the serial magmatism suggested the lunar crust is the product of multiple intrusions of the basaltic magma. Each differentiation during and after emplacement and uh, plagio class ridge accumulates from the uh, from the intrusion rise into the crust, and the uh, mafia accumulates would sink uh, sink down. It is uh, similar to a uh, lunar magma ocean, but it is more on a regional scale. And each uh, each of the plagial clays and would have different com composition depending on the physical and chemical char characteristics of their source regions. So uh, they propose the serial magmatism and they think maybe the lunar magma ocean uh, hypothesis is just wrong. And there are also many limitations of current lunar rocks. The most outstanding issue is a sample bias. First, there are many lithologies that observe through remote sensing techniques and have not been discovered yet. As shown in the figure, uh, this is called OOS lithology. And they are dominated by orthopyroxene or olivine or uh, magnesium-rich spinel. They are kind of widespread on the moon. These are the locations of, of OOS lithology. Uh, although we do find spinel rich lithology, the proportions of this is much, much lower. Maybe it's only accounts for about uh, 30%, but they, they suggest the uh, spinel would be more than 95%. So we did not find anything that is uh, that's been a rich. And also evolved silicate minerals are much lower than those found by remote sensing. Evolved silicate materials are uh, found uh, on several places on the moon, including andesite and dacite, but we did not find any samples have, that have this composition. Granitic and Felsic materials, which belong to the alkaline suits, only occurs as small fragments or clusters. And more interestingly, mean, more interestingly uh, materials from South Pole Aikin Basin have, has not been sampled yet. And the second, we have already stressed that. Apollo samples, we know the uh, exact location on the surface, but they are restricted to the PKT area. The chemical composition is limited. Um, the lunar meteorites may be more representative, but we do not know the exact source of them. And third, the chronology. Uh, Apollo samples and the lunar meteorites have a limited age range. For now, the most, uh, the youngest, uh, lunar meteorites we have dated is about 2.8 trillion years. However, um, the crater ages we, ob uh, we obtained from remote sensing techniques uh, told us that maybe there are some volcanism that uh, uh, happened one, uh, one trillion years ago. So there uh, should be many more younger Lunar, uh, lunar samples we have, we have, we have not get. And the samples returned by Channel 5 mission are derived from a young male unit, which may provide more information on younger lunar magmatism. The Channel 5 uh, landing site is about uh, two trillion years. So this may um, be the youngest samples that we can ever get. Uh, last is a short sum summary. Different lunar rock, rocks can be assigned to different terrains on the moon. 
the lunar rocks can be divided into pristine highland rocks, male basalts, and uh, polymic bracture. And they are divided based on the chemical composition and the petrological texture. They are indicative of different processes. For example, ferron anorthite is indicative of the lunar magma ocean concept. And male basalts are uh, indicative of male mag magmatism and the polymic pressures are more indicative of him impact history. And also variable clusters in branches have a great diversity. This would expand our knowledge of, of lithologies on the moon and help us to understand the reformation of the lunar surface by impact. And also we know that uh, the highland rocks are mainly composed of feldspathic plagioclase and the male basalts are composed of uh, the uh, high uh, calcium rich pyroxene and uh, plagioclase and olivin. So uh, we can also know that the highland is enriched in uh, Aluminum and the male areas is enriched in iron and magnesium. And also based on the mineral assemblages, if we find um, if we find something that is enriched in uh, in OPX in the uh, calcium poor pyroxene, we may know that they are derived from uh, highland or uh, the deep metal. And if we found much, much, much more uh, calcium rich pyroxene and, all, and the less plagioclase, we may know that they are uh, the derived from a uh, male unit. So the, there are much more to learn, and we still have, uh, we still don't know many things about the. Uh, the lunar history and the evolution of lunar magmatism. Okay, thank you. I'm ready to take some questions. Yeah, um, so I will thank you very much for, for this, you know, very, very, very detailed uh, talk. And as we said, you know, it's very complicated. Um, and uh, I have a bit of time, it's, uh, um, it's uh, short, uh, but I, let me ask you a question because I, I, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that you say that uh, that the, the the LMO the lunar magma ocean now does yeah. might not have exist no, before it. Uh, uh, I mean, why why did you say that? Uh, actually, the lunar magma ocean is uh, widely accepted. We know that, but mm -hmm. Uh, based on some lithologies in uh, lunar meteorites, for example, if the uh, the lunar magma ocean is more like a um, a whole scale molten, now the um, like this is molten on on a um, on a whole scale. So if it, if the lunar magma ocean is right, then the uh, then the feldspathic crust would be ferron rich because when the melt crystallized at the at the late stage, the melt would be enriched in iron and uh, incompatible elements. However, this one is a uh, anorthite, but it is enriched in magne ma magnesium. Magnesium should be the uh, uh, should be the earliest to form uh, in a melt. How do you say? Actually, uh, they have proposed. Okay, there are two reasons. Uh, remote sensing results suggest that the far side contain less ion and thorium than the near side. And the return samples uh, of the ferron on our side are, come, are restricted to the PKD areas. They are from the near side. So the lunar magma ocean was proposed because of the ferron on north side we get from the near side. Um, but the far side of the moon is uh, contains less iron and more magnesium. 
the hypo the hypothesis uh, is proposed because of the the ferron uh, because of the uh, ferron chemical signatures, and if we if they want to uh, still continue using the lunar magma ocean concept, they need to uh, revise their uh, revise the theory. For example, the whole lunar magma ocean would may not be uh, may not be uh, the same on the near side and the far side. This is a, a symmetric cross composition of the of the uh, far side and the near side. It's hard to it's hard to um, to explain because there are many many uh, details in this uh, in the uh, deduction during mm -hmm. during this this one. So, uh, but still, I think lunar magma ocean is um, is still uh, more accepted than uh, other than other hypotheses. Okay. Oh, and good. also one one important uh, one important thing about the lunar magma ocean is, uh, the ferro or north side is uh, they uh, they assume that they may be formed uh, they may form before four point four billion years. However, there are many uh, ferro and north sides that are younger than this age. It means uh, the cooling of the lunar magma ocean may be uh, much longer than we thought, but actually uh, it's hard for, for it to, to maintain such, uh, such a long period. So they may think maybe uh, it's just doesn't like that. Okay, we, there's so much you know, to learn now that, that we, we yes. still have to hear uh, 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 more, more, more uh, lectures like this uh, to clarify this issue. But the time is up, um, and then the uh, I think that the the next speaker, Professor Peter Woods, is already waiting. So I would uh, I would say thank you again, you know, Dr. Wu, and then the, I look forward to meeting you in person sometime in near future. Yeah.